in South Carolina. Uh, and we in the state, as, as I think everyone in this room knows, take great pride in our military tradition. Uh, we consider ourselves a state of patriots. And, and uh, in fact, we've got uh, four cities in the, in the state who all declare themselves to be the most friendly, military friendly city in the United States. Um, well, there, there actually is some evidence that would, uh, uh, would justify that conclusion. Uh, I, I think con congratulations are in order for uh, the Columbia, uh, Greater Columbia region, who this year has been named uh, the uh, uh, American uh, Defense Communities, uh, uh, Great American Defense Communities uh, City by the um, Association of Defense Communities, and that is quite a distinction and certainly well-deserved. Uh, and General Beagle, I think you would uh, attest that it's, uh, it is well-deserved. Um, and, and quite frankly, not to be outdone, uh, Joint Base Charleston and the Charleston community were recognized in a similar way a year before last. So we've got two uh, distinguished communities in South Carolina that, that stand up for their military and make themselves uh, well known for their friendliness towards our military installations. The uh, uh, program, of course, today is, is focused on the commanders in the middle and, and the governor and now uh, Congressman Wilson, who who is here and, and uh, is, is most welcome, and we're delighted to have him. Uh, at this time, it's my great privilege uh, to present to you the Honorable Governor McMaster, a man who, who cares about his military just as much as I do. Just a couple of things to say. One is we're working hard to in the legislature, and of course we've got to run out of time, there are a lot of things we're trying to do with education and economic growth. But one of them that's uh, tied in that very importantly is, a, is tax relief for our first responders and military retirees, that is to eliminate the income tax on retirement pay. So, I think everybody in the legislature recognizes the importance of the military in South Carolina from our history at the very beginning uh, all the way to now and as far as we can see in the future. And it's very important that we, that we understand that and realize how important it is, not only to the country and to the world, because you've got to be strong if you turn on the television. Matter of fact, I tell you what I've done recently, I discovered Channel 80 on my television, the BBC. Instead of watching some of the American news shows, you watch that thing, you find out there are people getting killed and shot out all over the world. And uh, it, it puts things put things in perspective and makes you realize how important and how fortunate we are to have had strong military uh, all these years to, to bring us to where we are. So I, I want to thank you. I want to say also that uh, coming to my desk soon as past the House and the Senate is a bill that uh, Bill, I think, has been working on for about eight or nine years, but finally we are changing the military division uh, in the Department of Administration to Department of Veterans Affairs uh, with a, uh, a secretary, and that is, that's coming. That will raise that interest up to cabinet level, and that will be uh, this kind of And we're delighted to have with us today Congressman Joe Wilson, now, there has never been a stronger supporter of the, our military than we have in our congressman, and we ask you please to address the group. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a real honor to be here with, the, again, two champions of the military, and that would be Chairman Bill Bethea and Governor Henry McMaster. And so, and particularly, I'm here in multiple roles. Uh, first, as a, a member of the Armed Services Committee, I'm very grateful to be on the Readiness and Strategic Forces Subcommittees. Uh, and uh, it's just so meaningful to me to have the opportunity to uh, represent our state. Additionally, I'm here as a veteran myself, uh, serving uh, in the reserves, uh, Army Reserves and Army Guard for 31 years. But I'm particularly grateful to be here uh, as a uh, military dad. And uh, because of many other people in this room, 
uh, all four of my sons, uh, as I would go through the community, uh, they saw the most capable, competent, and patriotic people that I would run into would be people who have actually served in the military. So all four of my sons have uh, served, and I'm really grateful. Three in the uh, Army Guard, and then uh, we are a joint service. I do have a, a, a son, an orthopedic surgeon, a doctor at uh, Buford Naval Hospital, so we we'll claim him. And then uh, I also want to claim a nephew who's in the Air Force. And so it's particularly um, meaningful to be here with commanders of uh, all the different uh, branches, and just uh, I'm honored to uh, be with uh, such people who are dedicated to a strong national defense. God bless you. Thank you. We may have some questions here, but I'd like to be a, a little bit informal if we can. If anybody has a, a, a real good question, even a stupid one, that you just can't hold, because uh, there ain't no such thing as a stupid question, they tell me. So uh, if you have something that you want to add to the discussion, or when they get through with the presentations each in succession, please raise your hand, we'll call on you and get some ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. We're pleased now to start uh, the presentations from our distinguished guest. And uh, to begin those, uh, we have uh, Major General Van McCarty, uh, our, our uh, distinguished uh, uh, leader of the uh, National Guard in South Carolina. Governor, uh, Congressman Wilson, I'm going to ex just to extend protocol out as it's already been extended to all the others here today. Uh, Mr. Farrell, I think uh, my reputation somewhat precedes him on being long-winded, so he came up and said, make sure you keep it short. As my dad used to say, the boy just likes to talk, so I will try to <laughs> keep it short somewhat today if I can. But it is my privilege to have the opportunity here today to talk a little bit about the South Carolina Military Department and to give just a little bit of background on that organization. The Military Department of South Carolina consists of just more than just the National Guard. The uh, National Guard, by, by far, is the largest of that organization on the Army side. We have a little over 9,300 soldiers that are housed in 40 of our 46 counties around the state. And on our Air National Guard, we have around 1,400 guardsmen. Air, our Air National Guardsmen and all of those, fortunately, are at, at McIntyre Air National Guard base. But the organization consists of more than that. It consists of the South Carolina Emergency Management Division, our state EMD, uh, with uh, Director Kim Stinson there, our South Carolina Military Museum. And if you never had an opportunity to go there, I would encourage you to go by and visit. If you come to our state headquarters, come through the main gate and just proceed to the back, they'll direct you there. I think you'll find a very, very nice military museum that, that gives honor to the South Carolina National Guard and its history all the way back to the colonial days to the present. Also, our emergency, excuse me, our state youth challenge program and our job challenge program where we have young people that come from either disadvantaged backgrounds or just have not fit in well in our public schools and they're a part of a 22-week program that helps orient them back to really a more disciplined way of life. It, is, it mirrors very much like a boot camp with an education component there. Uh, the job challenge part of it, we partner with Aiken Tech and with Clemson Extension, and they go and take courses at Aiken Tech for a certificate type program to help prepare them for a role in the, in the economy or in the civilian economy to be tax paying uh, productive citizens. The job challenge program is also a 22 week program. Uh, we have also our state, state guard, which is about 750 members. They have supported all of our major emergencies in South Carolina over the last few years. We've had as many as 400 of those state guardsmen deployed, some of them on duty as much as 30 days, our engineers going over to Marion, Mullins County, and providing engineer assessments, helping those counties recover. We have our state joint services detachment and our state star base program, which is a program that promotes the STEM technology, and it is geared towards fifth graders, and that is housed also at McIntyre. The National Guard now is an operational reserve. Since 9-11, the state of South Carolina has deployed over 25,000 soldiers and airmen to the war on, to the global war on terror, 
and unfortunately we have lost 16 of our soldiers in support of those operations. We are an expeditionary force today. We have soldiers and airmen throughout the world not only supporting the war fight, but in supporting other initiatives throughout the world. Our first of the 151 Combat Aviation Battalion just deployed back from Afghanistan and was recently named Aviation Unit of the Year along with the 238, which was part of our Chinook unit. They were a part of Task Force Marauder, which was the third ID, and Lieutenant Colonel Jay McElveen was named as the Deputy Commander of the third CAD for that deployment. Quite an honor for him. In UCOM, we've had units deployed, the 678 ADA Brigade, the 218th Maneuver Enhancement Brigade was there in support of Operation and Exercise uh, Resolute Castle. And we've also had the Signal Brigade deployed in support of Operation Atlantic Resolve. We are deployed and we are currently have units deployed in the war fight. The 1221st, a route engineering company out of Grantville is currently deployed in the CENTCOM AOR supporting combat operations in Iraq and in Syria. Our 169th Fighter Wing just returned back from a real world deployment last year. Those units, that unit is capable of and stands ready each and every day with a certain number of aircraft, we won't go into that, but it stands by 24-7 at McIntyre, ready to defend the skies over the, over the eastern part of this country to prevent hopefully another 9-11 type attack. In support of the homeland, in addition to what I just stated with the Air National Guard, the 263rd Army Air Missile Defense Command. The Army has four Army Air Missile Defense Commands. One of them is in the Reserve or the National Guard and is located in South Carolina up in Anderson, South Carolina. They help manage the air defense capabilities that are in the National Capital Region in Washington, and they work with U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD to help support the entire uh, air defense picture throughout Continental and the uh, Alaska and Aleutian Island chains. We also have soldiers that are currently deployed in support of the Southwest Border Mission. That number fluctuates, it's only around 15 now, and those are aviators that help in that mission there. I mentioned earlier our State Emergency Management Division has been actively involved. We go back to the flood of 2015, Following that, Hurricane Matthew, most recently Hurricane Florence, uh, they've been quite involved. Uh, we hope, sir, to have a year here that we're not quite as active, but even if they're not actively involved in, the, in that response, they train all the time to be ready for that next worst day of being in South Carolina. South Carolina is considered by the National Guard Bureau as a growth state. As a result of that, we recently were able to uh, grow and establish the 125th, the 125th Cyber Protection Battalion. Uh, they came online and within a year were in mission up at Fort Meade, Maryland, and they're in the process of returning from that mission now. And I'll have an opportunity on Wednesday to go up and see some of those last soldiers come back in for their demobilization at the Fort Bragg. In addition, we're also in the process of building the 117th Engineer Brigade. That will be a higher headquarters for the two other engineer battalions in the state. 122nd and the 178th Engineer Battalion. In our cyber effort, we're very pleased at the opportunity we have in cyber in South Carolina. We have a great opportunity with Fort Gordon being the Cyber Center of Excellence. As you know, sir, we're working now in the Aiken area to build a readiness center there. We're looking to partner with the academia, academia side of the house, possibly either with USC Aiken or with Aiken Tech, but it will be a partnership that includes not only the National Guard, but our, our institutions of higher learning, and we're also be working with the private sector here in South Carolina to ensure that we have a foothold in what is a very robust and growing opportunity here in the state of South Carolina. As far as our growth here in the state, sir, I mentioned we have armories or units located in 40 of our 46 counties. That also means that we have quite an investment, and that investment though includes what is a, a downside of that, we have about $82 million in deferred maintenance that needs to be done on those armories. We've been thankful for what you have done, sir, in helping to uh, secure budget and funding for that. 
Uh, we're actively working now with both the House and the Senate to get money there to help us reduce that deferred maintenance piece. We're also, though, in the process of two additional Milcon projects, the one I mentioned over at Aiken, and another one is a Milcon project that we're partnering with, Joint Base Task Force or Joint Base Charleston. would like to recognize Colonel Adams for some work that he did for us recently that we believe has gotten us over a very significant hump there. Uh, he came in at the last moment and, um, and reinforced what we have been saying and believing all along. And we think we're on the last of the requirements piece now to make that happen. That partnership with Joint Base Charleston will save the state of South Carolina $2.2 million in state matching dollars for that project. So that was a, a great hit. Last, sir, I mentioned earlier our Youth Challenge Program. Uh, that Job Challenge Program, that program will cease to exist after this year unless we're able to get some additional funding. Again, we're, we're working with both the House and the Senate on that funding. We had a great meeting this past weekend, and we're optimistic now that that funding may be put back in the budget. If so, that program, we believe, is another driver that will help us prepare the young people of this state to meet the many economic challenges that are ahead of us as this state moves forward in a more high-tech manner. So our subject in your questions, that completes what I have. Uh, there will handouts that will pass out that includes our 2018 operational annual report. It will give you a more detailed history and background of all those programs that I mentioned. And I believe the, the little briefing sheet that I briefed off was also left. Thank you, General. Does anyone have any questions, comments? On what General McCarty said. Everybody awake? <laughs> Thank you, General. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> Our next presenter is a, a, a native son of South Carolina, uh, the commander at Fort Jackson, uh, the uh, uh, Brigadier General Milford Beagle. General Beagle, thank you very much for being here. Sir, and good morning. So, sir, I, like Joe McCarty, I was told I had all the time I wanted to talk, but I had six minutes to talk as long as I wanted to talk. <laughs> he used up one of them for you. <laughs> but to everybody, good morning. And again, Governor McMaster, Chairman Wilson, fellow commanders, and to our many distinguished guests and members of the Military Base Task Force, thank you so much for this opportunity to update you on the current status of Fort Jackson. Now, before arriving to Fort Jackson, a short 10 months ago, the only advice or guidance that I was given by a senior Army leader was that the Army goes however Fort Jackson goes. There's new, no true statement that can be made about Fort Jackson. My stated vision for Fort Jackson is to be the recognized leader in basic combat training, as well as be an installation consistently recognized for excellence. As an example, senior military leader interest in what Fort Jackson does for our Army is at an all-time high, and it will continue to be that way for the months and years ahead. As evidence, I'll point out our recent hosting of the Training and Doctrine Command, Commanders Forum, and our upcoming hosting of the Civilian Aid to the Secretary of the Army's conference in May. This event will bring about 90 CASAs and their family members, as well as Army senior leaders from across our nation to Fort Jackson so that they can receive updates on Army initiatives. We remain a direct contributor to Army readiness by producing combat-ready soldiers at a scale unmatched elsewhere else in our United States Army. We do this by focusing on four fundamental priorities. The execution of our basic combat training, the development of our leaders, the quality of life for our families and our soldiers, and connecting the American people with the Army story. Training is my top priority for the installation. Fort Jackson has long ranked first among basic combat training centers, producing more soldiers than the other three training centers combined. Over the past year, we've staked a claim for primacy based on quality as well as quantity. Pilot programs at Fort Jackson led to the Army-wide adoption of our new program of instruction. This program increases the physical and mental rigors of our training and produces discipline, physically fit graduates that are more committed to our army. As we refine this new program of instruction, we're also looking at our internal procedures. 
to ensure that training is effective, it is conducted efficiently, and produces consistent results. As good as our basic training units are, we can improve, and this is my top priority for the installation. Our second priority is leader development, and that's closely tied to the first. The ability to provide world class training begins by ensuring every leader is a capable and fully trained trainer. However, we do not want to limit ourselves to military experiences. Many institutions in South Carolina, commercial, academic, governmental, have valuable leader experience which can further develop our leaders. Our goal is to form mutually supporting and beneficial partnerships with our local partners. Our Army readiness is dependent upon recruiting and retaining quality leaders. Therefore, a third priority is improving the quality of life for our soldiers and their families. Quality of life perceptions among Army families are directly tied to three critical areas. Quality of health care, education, and employment opportunities for our spouses. South Carolina and our local Midlands community play a critical role in helping us meet the expectation of our Army families. As a side note, and similar to the other Army installations, we are aggressively addressing our housing challenges. We experience some of the same frustrations as our other installations with our privatized partners. Responsiveness, customer service, transparency, and work quality. But as the senior leader at Fort Jackson, this is my problem to fix. Governor McMaster, as you well know, the South Carolina Department of Labor is working very hard with our military spouses and on reciprocal and temporary licenses. Recent changes on their website provide details about licensing procedures and staff contact information to help military spouses attain employment even before they arrive to South Carolina. We already make extensive use of the robust healthcare network available here in Columbia. This may expand in the future as the Army focuses its medical resources on combat care and away from routine medicine. But this, the good news is, Columbia has an excellent healthcare network that can likely absorb any additional workload for our installation's residents. We're equally fortunate to be aligned with the premier Richland II School District. The relationship between Fort Jackson and our school district is solid, and we look forward to continuing our mutually supported cooperation. And our fourth and final priority is simply to make the Army story and the Fort Jackson story more accessible to the people of South Carolina. My hope is to foster a much better relationship with South Carolina residents who return to their towns and their counties with a better understanding and appreciation of what we do at Fort Jackson. I want the community to know that we're committed to them and that we are their honor. Allow me to conclude by acknowledging the four priorities that I discussed today. Basic combat training, leader development, quality of life, and outreach to our community. Work together does not fully capture the true relationship of Fort Jackson to the state or Columbia. Live together comes closer. Recognizing the majority of our workforce does not live in Fort Jackson, but in the surrounding communities. Our soldiers and families are in your churches. They're in your neighborhood associations. They're in your parent-teacher organizations. We do not just reside in South Carolina. We are a part of it. We are proud to live in one of five communities recognized in 2019 as a great American defense community. So perhaps the best expression would be to say that we succeed together. I am reminded of the famous African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So let there be no doubt that Fort Jackson wants to go far. We are committed to doing so with our local and our state communities. So, sir, thank you, and thank you all very much. Thank you, General. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General Beagle. Uh, our next presenter is Major General James Glenn from the place where they make Marines, Paris Island, South Carolina. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. My pleasure. And uh, good morning, Governor McMaster, Congressman Wilson, and members of the 
Military Base Task Force. Thanks for having us here today and give, you, give us all a chance to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and, and what's new. Because I think you all know there's plenty of Marines in the room as I learned on my way in this morning. We've been making Marines here in South Carolina this year for 104 years. So I imagine many of those years somebody stood up here and told you what, what's going on and, and I, as I reflected on what might be interesting I thought I'd talk about what's new. One of the things is, this isn't new, but our responsibilities at Paris Island also extend across the entire eastern part of the United States for recruiting. And it's right here in Columbia, as a matter of fact, we have a recruiting station that talks to young men and women about their future. What's new this year is that the mission of making Marines for the Marine Corps is the biggest it's been in 10 years. Almost 40,000 Marines will be found and made the most fully qualified, will be sought out in communities like yours and, and across the many states. But at the same time, 20,000 of them will come here to Paris Island. Their first steps, literally, those yellow footprints that are iconic and well-known in this state, will be here on Paris Island and be a place that uh, they'll forever call home. As was highlighted this past week when we had a group from VFA 115, led by a general by the name of Spider Island, the former assistant commandant, he and many of his colleagues stood on those footprints 50 years ago, and a handful of them had never been back in those 50 years and reminded just how special it was to come back to South Carolina and be welcome home to Paris Island. So that's not an easy job. And, and there's Marines all over the Eastern seaboard, as I mentioned, all the way out to the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, talking to young men and women about their future. And as my good friend, General Beagle, who he didn't mention, you know, a year ago today, he and I were standing in Baghdad together. That's the nature of today's military and today's fight. Uh, we were on, on a team called Operation Inherent Resolve. And uh, as fate has it, and we knew it back then, that we find ourselves together here in South Carolina. So it's good to, good to bring the team back together here. Marines on recruiting duty spend an inordinate amount of time, uh, in excess of 60 hours a week, talking to young men and women about their future. And that's what we have in common with many educators here in South Carolina and, and across our recruiting region. And we bring educators to the tune of 100 per week from January to May here to South Carolina to talk about that future for young men and women. And their hard work allows us to fulfill that mission of recruiting and making Marines. As I mentioned, we've been doing for 104 years. In terms of the base itself, the infrastructure, the community impact, many of you have played a role in what we call an energy savings performance contract, a $91 million endeavor that will come to fruition here later this spring, as a matter of fact. It's the replacement of a, of a number of items to include a 70-year-old power plant, steam-generating power plant, that is now replaced with the capacity for us to make up to 10 megawatts of power, 6.5 megawatts from solar power alone. And for the better part of the year, that will allow us to exceed our energy requirements at Paris Island and permit us to provide that back into the grid. And in addition to those pieces of of improvements, we, we've also made uh, $25 million direct impact this year with the construction of the Marine Corps' newest known distance rifle range. Many are familiar with the notion that all Marines are riflemen and that it's a basis of the infantry. This $25, $25 million investment was recently opened. In fact, the first unit is qualifying on that range this week. And we have, we'll, provide a, the contract for the next range, there are four ranges in Paris Island. The next range, estimated at nearly $30 million, will begin construction later this year. And we've identified to the Congress the requirement for the third of those fourth ranges also, estimated at nearly $30 million. And I highlight those to make it clear that the direct economic impact of military construction between the energy savings performance at 91 million and the 85 million that's been that's been earmarked for military construction of ranges and ranges alone. Combined with all the other contributing factors, the, the latest estimate, which is from 2017, has, has just Paris Island, and Colonel Tim Miller will come up and talk about the air station, but just Paris Island's economic impact on the low country and on South Carolina at over a, half a billion dollars. So while the primary mission of Paris Island is to make Marines, we've been a member, as I mentioned, of the, of the local community for over 100 years, along with our naval partners that started 
with, with a with a coaling plant down there in, in 1891. This year makes it 128 years. And in terms of what that means as an attraction to folks that come, not just for graduations every week, where we hold a graduation for New Marines 44 weeks out of the year, but between our, our museum and our visitor center, the museum alone had over 100,000 visitors last year. And our visitor center had 70,000. You put that together with, with all the other folks that come to visit, like the educators that I mentioned, and the economic impact, the tourism that's brought to the Low Country, makes makes our teamwork on a variety of fronts uh, fairly prolific and a, and a real centerpiece of our relationship with both the state and the county. With regards to the county, as you're well aware, we work very closely when it comes to destructive weather and inclement weather. This year, Hurricane Florence was a, was a perfect example. We were prepared to move upwards of 8,000 folks from Paris Island to a safer location, and thankfully ended up not having to. But nonetheless, it highlighted the relationship that we have with the state and the communication that we all have with the local community, in particular with Beaufort County and its emergency management division. They have been instrumental in our communication uh, both up to your level, sir, at the state level, as well as with external entities in neighboring states like Georgia and North Carolina, depending on, on where and when we need to go. We're grateful for the close support of the Beaufort County Emergency Management Division, and we'll continue to make local evalu evacuation decisions based on safety concerns and with an acknowledgement to the impact to the local community. So in conclusion, the South Carolina community community and its leadership, in particular its state and local leaders, continue to be phenomenal partners. Though not mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll give the nod to Beaufort County, Jasper County, and many of the others for what they provide in terms of a, a very, very strong partnership. And while many new Marines, as I mentioned, come from right here in South Carolina, many not so new Marines, a handful of which are in this room, eventually come to call South Carolina their home. And we're glad they didn't have to go far to begin their journey as Marines. Families are an extremely important part of, of the Marine Corps, as was mentioned a moment ago for the Army. And I'd like to thank many folks in this room for your continued support of many beneficial programs, too many to name, that support our military families and their children's educational requirements, as well as the many entities not in this room, but represented that support things like the Toys for Tots. At our graduation, which I mentioned occurs nearly every week, 44 weeks out of the year, we witness new Marines surrounded by family and friends overcome by emotion. As they walk across the parade deck, beginning the next chapter in their lives, a chapter that, that many have, have encouraged them and helped them get on. The pride is just the beginning of their journey, and as I mentioned a moment ago, the beginning to their Marine Corps career started right here in South Carolina. And many of them will find their way back here, sometimes in a year, sometimes in 50 years. And many of them will call it home, just as I and many others who are still in uniform have the privilege to do. And so I thank you for your continued support of your Marine Corps Paris. Thank you. Thank you. statewide network and I want to tell everyone that we had visitors coming in from different states, high ranking visitors, and they were the voice there uh, impressed with the precision and the co coordination and the collaboration of our, our forces and that includes of course the, the National Guard as well as Department of Transportation, Department of Natural Resources, uh, and SLED and the way the military all fit into that, and they, they really said they hadn't seen anything like that anywhere else in the country. Uh, it, it's good to see what other people think of you every now and then. We, we were right at the top of the scale on that response, so we, we thank you for that. Any questions, suggestions, ideas? General, you are free. <laughs> Our next speaker, 
uh, comes from uh, the U.S. Army Central Command, and, and uh, he's going to share with us what is probably a uh, an barely kept secret uh, uh, about what happens in, in Shaw Air Force Base other than flying planes. Thank you, Mr. Pate. Uh, now, Mr. Pate, I mentioned General Beagle and his references to uh, South Carolina and his individual ties, good Governor. Uh, my wife would be mad at me if I, and I'm, I'm in the heart of University of South Carolina, but she's a Clemson grad. My mother-in-law lives in Clemson, so I gotta say all in and go Tigers. <laughs> and then my other tie to South Carolina is the, the, the Major General Van McCarty has a real cool uh, first name, which is tied in mind. So uh, we, we must be keen at, at, at some point. Now. So good morning, Governor, uh, Congressman, Major General uh, uh, McCarty, uh, Mr. Bethea, uh, fellow GOs, and distinguished guests. Uh, I'm Jeff Van. I serve as the Chief of Staff for U.S. Army uh, Central Command, stationed at Shaw Air Force Base in a Sumter, South, uh, South Carolina Patent Zone. And uh, hello to, to, to our uh, Sumter family, uh, which I saw earlier to, today. On behalf of our, our, our Commanding General, Lieutenant General Terry Farrell, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today uh, to represent our, our command and thank the state leadership for the continued great support from the uh, great state of South Carolina. Governor McMaster, uh, last no November, actually uh, you didn't remember me then, but uh, I, I actually got to meet you as, as you and your wife celebrated the third Army Centennial uh, which we executed here in Columbia as we entered a new century. USR Sin is turning the page in our history books. At the end of 2018, the President announced uh, his intent to end operations in Syria, and sooner or, or later we'll end up uh, ending or lessening our operations in Afghanistan uh, to conclude our defeat ISIS cam campaign with our coalition partners and from around the world. As we secure these vital interests, from the violent extremist organizations, which we call DEO. We also have the challenge of reassuring our allies and our partners that a reduced U.S. presence does not mean that we are a nation that whose will is prevented to extremist organizations, nor from attacking our homeland or our uh, citizens abroad. Our dawn of a new century campaign is how we are communicating U.S. our sense tra tradition and our continued commitment to delivering constant readiness whenever and wherever we're sent. Our, our approach over time will be to reset our theater posture and shape our conditions that leads to, to the next generation's army and project our national power more efficiently with, by, with, and through of our allies and our partners with interoperability. I'd like to just offer a quick overview of what U.S. Army Central does as it relates to our overall headquarters, the Department of the Army, uh, and, and the Geographic Combatant Command, which is Central Command out of Tampa, Florida. Our new commanding general, which is Lieutenant General Terry Farrell, uh, recently took command a month ago. Uh, he is actually was, was on a plane yesterday going to Kuwait, and I'll meet him in Qatar in about uh, 36 hours. And our service capacity as the Army Senior Service Command, our, uh, our, our, rep, our responsibilities include administration and support of theater deployed Army forces and providing Army support to other services. And that, that's a direct report to the uh, Department of the Army. Our other headquarters, which we report to, is Army Central Command, as we have responsibilities to General McKenzie, uh, who was the new commander of U.S. CENTCOM who assumed command on the 28th of March. Our responsibilities in include uh, operational control of assigned Army forces from U.S. Army Central Command and advising the combatant commanders both of uh, Operations Freedom Sentinel, which is in Afghanistan, and Operation Inherent Resolve, which is still in Syria and Iraq, on requirements for land forces. This entails, but is not limited to, the planning and executing the security cooperation which is our effort to work with other nations and militaries in the region to build interoperability, maintain our access and other permissions, and demonstrate our combined resolve in a volatile region. We do this through Operation Spartan Shield, which covers over 16 separate countries in Southwest Egypt, to include Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, Amman, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and, uh, and other countries in, this, in the Central Asian states, which wrap around the north and then the east side of Afghanistan. 
So we also coordinate execution of joint land operations with other operations uh, and other components, coalition partners, and supporting agencies to include, uh, and that, this is going back to uh, the OFR and Heritage Resolve and OFS and Freedom Sentinel in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. We also synchronize fires, maneuver, and movement, and with the coalition forces, component command, uh, we execute theater counter uh, ballistic missile defense. In addition to, to these critical roles, RCIN fulfills a role as the land component command of countries throughout U.S. CITCOM area of responsibility, with few exceptions being Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. RCIN is the U.S. partner for land force uh, component commands in, 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 in the CITCOM AOR, which includes just over 30,000 soldiers, and these are Army soldiers in Southwest Asia, and then we have operational con control of just uh, over 15,000 under RCIN operational control of Operation Freedom um, uh, Spartan Shield. We have a vital role to play in regional and very little happens in the region without our involvement, our input, and our direct actions. The Middle East and the Levant has reached their most unstable point in many decades as a result of trends dating back more than 30 years. Trends that, that include state aggressors, weapons of mass destruction, violent extremists, and near-peer competition with state-sponsored threats with Russia and China. Spillover and violence, mass refugee movement, and uh, opportuni uh, opportunist terrorist groups. A number of these social, political root causes of the Arab awakening remain present in our AOR, increasing social unrest and, and creating conditions for violent extremists. Iran remains and, and remains our region's primary state aggressor with a strategy, strategy designed to undermine U.S. Re regional influence and that for partner. The threats are actual close to our str strategic stroke point, choke points, which include the Suez Canal, the uh, Straits of Hormuz, and the Bailout al, -Al Mendez Straits. Uh, they also have pursuit to uh, nuclear weapons, general military provocation, and interference in our other national affairs amongst the triggers that, that could draw the U.S. <coughs> in, uh, into conflict. Iran cyber attacks against partner nations increase the overall operational risk. Moving to Syria, the Syrian government, supported by Iran and Russia, is entrenched in conflict, and the outcome of the civil war there is very unpredictable. State aggressors and competitors seek to supplant U.S. influence in the AOR, and they will reinforce their, their own regional ties, ties while simultaneously dissuading U.S. allies and partners of the United States reliability and then our commitment in, in that region. The threat from VEOs to uh, U.S. interests in home and abroad will persist as long as conditions across the re region fuel e extremism. VEOs spread their anti-Western rhetoric and, re uh, and rhetoric and, and refugees with internally displaced persons are vulnerable and radicalization of foreign fighters re return to the homeland. So move, moving closer uh, to the home and in, in South Carolina, transitioning to our sense impact in South Carolina. Despite our small size, our soldiers, civilians, and contractors have had an outsized impact on the state. U.S. Arson has approximately 900 military and civilian personnel with a payroll economic output of $174 million each year. Most of these soldiers and civilians live in the Sumter and Columbia communities. This and our other activities in South Carolina translate to an uh, annual economic impact of roughly $240 million on South Carolina with the impact of $170 million just within the Sumter region. Many soldiers living uh, the, in, in the military stay in the Midland region and pursue employment after retirement. This trend adds value to our local communities by retaining smart, dedicated, law-abiding citizens and local businesses and schools increase in the local impact. We support the state's effort to attract veterans and their families to live and work in South Carolina through the veteran-friendly hiring practices, uh, beneficial tax, tax laws, and continually improving the, the quality of life here. As you know, South Carolina has a National Guard State Partnership Program with the, Columbia of Colum uh, with the country of Columbia, but there's also opportunity uh, for South Carolina to impact the vital region of the world. 
Uh, right now, we only have six countries out of the 20 nations which are sent covers with the state sponsorship program. So we're actively looking back through the Joint Staff and then with uh, Major General McCartney and the and National Guard Bureau as far as uh, getting South Carolina uh, partnered up with another uh, country. Governor McMaster, uh, Mr. Bethay, uh, Major General McCartney, and our distinguished guest, guests, thanks you, thank you for this opportunity to highlight what U.S. Army Central is achieving in the Middle East. Although headquarters at Shaw Air Force Base with forward command and control sales fall forward, U.S. Army Central has worldwide impact in facilitating Army operations throughout the Middle East. On behalf of Lieutenant General Farrell, we look forward to continued opportunities to, to build this fantastic partnership uh, we have with the great state of South Carolina. Governor, thank you. Comments from General. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Colonel Terrence A. Adams, Joint Base Charleston. Thank you, Colonel Adams, for being with us. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. We bring you greetings from the Low Country of South Carolina. Um, I'm uh, originally from Alabama, Tuskegee, Alabama, and I went to school at, at Auburn and Montgomery. So you will be patient with me because we had a big loss over the weekend. If everybody was trying, right? <laughs> so please have some patience with me, okay? All right, so I'm joined here by an excellent team. I got my Navy Command Master Chief here. Um, he's representing this Joint Base Charleston kind of animal we have there. And Mr. Chad Bean, who took off a uniform, is now wearing a tie. And the most important person on my team is my LT there, who represents our public affairs. And she's the smartest person we had in the car coming up there. <laughs> so, Governor McMaster, uh, thank you for hosting this event. And, and uh, Congressman Wilson, uh, Mr. McFay, and we're happy to be here today to have a conversation about what's going on in Joint Base Charleston. I have the honor of representing about 92,000 individuals that, that serve and live around the Charleston area. Uh, they're soldiers and sailors and, and Marines and airmen. We also part with our Coast Guard there as well. Uh, we are spread across four geographically separated uh, land masses totaling about 24,000 acres. Uh, we have about 23,000 folks on active duty there in Joint Base Charleston. Joint Base Charleston is one of 12 Joint Bases that started about 10 years ago. So a unique animal with a unique mission that has spread across. Uh, we have the largest fleet, the C-17s, in the world. Uh, we're the only place that does nuclear training for the Navy across the whole Department of Defense. And we also have a large uh, IT animal organization, Spayward. I saw the commander just uh, pop in recently. Recently changed their name, name to the Naval Information Warfare Center. Uh, and they do a lot of IT and in integration in cyber across DOD. And so at Joint Base Charleston, we have a unique uh, partnership. So uh, the motto there is to maximize our partnerships uh, because partnerships equal success. So sir, I want to thank you first for the forum. And then second, you made an early decision, Governor, to uh, evacuate uh, the low country uh, during Hurricane Florence. And you kind of mentioned that, that response. Uh, it was my first day on the job, sir. So, <laughs> you made my decision uh, space a little easier because I didn't have to deal with it. And I know uh, John here was in a lot of those meetings with me uh, there at Joint Base Charleston, but a unique transition for me, sir. But thank you for that decision because it helped a lot. Um, also, thank you for my predecessor stood here um, some time ago and asked for support about traffic and your um, office responded. Uh, we also asked for support uh, surrounding our school choice and your staff responded, sir. So thank you for all the work uh, that you all have done. We want to continue to partner because partnership equals success. Uh, we still have some uh, traffic challenges around uh, the region there in Joint Base Charleston as a growing Charleston community. Uh, we uh, still want to try to get a traffic survey to be able to manage the traffic flow and perhaps maybe some more uh, traffic lights that will help us with the flow, and also some signage that will help direct our traffic as we just set up a new um, inspection area for all the vehicles that come in and out of the Navy side of Joint Base Charleston. Uh, and we also want to have a conversation as we move forward in the future about how can we partner with across the installations of South Carolina for new innovative ways. I'm sure all of the uh, installations have an, an aging infrastructure. So what can we do that we try to, to partner for the aging infrastructure that we have? We're also all challenged with being able to find um, a workforce, an innovative workforce, 
uh, that can answer the challenges that we have uh, toward the future. These are the things that I'm sure are collected and common across the board. They were challenged finding plumbers and electricians and welders. I think our nation at some point in time started focusing on the four-year degrees and in some ways lost the bubble on focusing on some of our trade and vocation areas. Uh, and that's what we're going to find ourselves continue to be challenged uh, toward the future. So what I would like to do is, uh, and what we're doing locally is partnering with universities there locally to try to uh, find unique ways of building a workforce instead of us just uh, having those people come and apply for jobs, go into the universities and try to have an opportunity to build what we need. And it's leading to and also an opportunity, I would say, across the installations, in some way to have a, a, a military STEM month for the state of South Carolina. Uh, and I would say focus on STEM and cyber. Uh, my background is cyber operations before I came to this job. And I would say, as we talk about the, the Secretary of Defense highlighted the global power competition that we're in um, across the globe, uh, and what does that mean as far as our ability to respond for, toward the future? And I would say that that means we need to have a renewed focus on STEM and also cyber um, across our nation. I remember growing up in some ways that uh, people would talk about uh, the race to the moon and our nation was, was tracking, and that's where you see all these engineering schools and the engineering uh, programs set up inside the co colleges and also in high schools. I think we need that same focus as we move toward this age of the ones and zeros in cyberspace. Uh, recently, I was growing up and having a conversation with some students, and all of them knew about how to cough in their sleeve. So there's messages that our nation has penetrated into our um, school systems and also our national t um, interest areas. Cyber, I believe, should be one of those. Uh, our frenemies, as I would call them, um, they would rather, in some ways, uh, steal our technology than in invest in their own. And I think if we move forward, we're going to have to have a nation that's going to be willing to respond to those things. And I think that conversation can start here in South Carolina. And what does that mean? How do we uh, take an opportunity to do that? And it goes back to the basis of how are we focusing on what our children are going to focus on. Uh, and I think the schools are going to play an important part. So school choice is an important part for us. Uh, so I would like to roll up our sleeves there and, and say we can host the conference if, if that's what we need to do uh, to start a conversation about how we partner across the state of South Carolina and also how we partner to success is looking at uh, cyber and STEM innovation. And sir, I'm happy to represent Joint Base Charleston. It's a wonderful, unique place. I've only been there for about six months, but you have a, a lot of friendly citizens that are around there. Um, they are willing to support our community, as evident by the, us, us winning the award in, in 2017. Uh, we're going to be focused on that again in 2020. Uh, we're also going to be hosting an air show, so you're all invited to come down to a, uh, a air and cyber and space expo. It's going to be April uh, in 2020. As a joint base, uh, we are hosting the Blue Angels, and they'll be coming down. So we'll have more information on that, but April 2020, uh, we'll have a new air show. So as I conclude, sir, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the support uh, that my predecessor came to your office, and you responded to that. Uh, thank you for getting your early decision for Hurricane Florence. And thank you for the opportunity to have a, 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 a partnership as we move forward, focusing on STEM, uh, focusing on cyber, and focusing on our nation's defense. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and the organization in general, the information for, for the group, you, you mentioned the workforce. And you're right, we have a cultural challenge, where particularly after World War II, the, the rule was everybody wanted to go to, to college to four years. Well, the technical schools, of course, are part of the higher education uh, in, in, the, in the country. Uh, Wilbur Ross, who's the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, has commented several times, he, he's familiar with the operation here, and he said that South Carolina, with his 16 technical colleges, which started in 1961, it's a mature system, it's very innovative, it says it's the finest in the United States. And that's one reason that we have a lot of business here invest in billions of dollars to come here. And we'll even, with that technical college system, we'll send a team to another country to look at their manufacturing plant to determine what kind of skills their, their employee, employees need in order to work there if they will come here. And we're the only people in the United States that do that. We have, as you mentioned, with uh, plumbers, uh, truck drivers, long distance uh, commercial truck drivers, uh, electricians and all, we are with about 60,000 people short. That is, we have 60,000 jobs looking for people in South Carolina, which is a, a, a new circumstance. Because usually it's, it's people looking for jobs. Now it's a very good paying job looking for people. So but we have to, have to 
uh, as, as, uh, as leaders and, and inform us. We have to make the case that uh, the world has changed as far as employment. And you don't, we still want those four year degrees and doctoral degrees and all of that. But uh, there's a new uh, economy out there, there's a new manufacturing, particularly, and it does not require four years, although the Greenville Technical College has invented and gotten uh, approved a four year degree in a uh, baccalaureate degree in uh, applied manufacturing. Uh, a four year degree is necessary for a lot of big manufacturing plants to move into management. So they have one there. But uh, we, are, we are introducing new programs to, uh, to streamline things and to uh, ease the flow from high school into the technical college system. And of course, with the people are free to continue that education after they get out. But we need to spread the word that those are where the, the great jobs are. You have truck jobs can make $100,000 a year. You, have, you can walk out with a degree in, in uh, welding and start off at 75,000 right now in South Carolina. And people in Greenville, there's one big plumbing company over there, they have to go to Tennessee to find plumbers. And we, this is a whole new world and they are, you can, a lot of these jobs, you, you can go to work in these big plants where you tuck seed or you walk and you won't even get dirty. They don't have grease and toolboxes anymore. Everybody's got computers and laptops and uh, tablets. So thank you for bringing that up and we appreciate the innovative Spirit. Any questions or suggestions for the Colonel? Yes, sir. We, we could have, could you tell, tell them who you are, please? Oh, yeah. I'm Tom Robert. I work with Bill on the task force and also with Mola. We need a labor force here in South Carolina. We need to have some workforce and we need to have some You're exactly right. Thank you. Anyone else? Colonel, thank you. Our next presenter is, is Colonel Lesko, uh, and he is he is with the Air Force Central Command uh, in uh, Sumter at uh, Shaw Air Force Base. Good morning, Governor. Wilson, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, as the other speakers have already said, we, we definitely appreciate the forum by which uh, we can talk to you and the community on the challenges and the uh, impressions we have uh, within the uh, South Carolina family. It's also great to see our Sumter family here uh, helping uh, be shoulder to shoulder with us. Uh, I would venture to say that uh, Carl Manley, General Van, and I uh, are going to throw our money into the uh, arm wrestling contest on the side of Sumter as the most uh, patriotic and military center. appreciate uh, town in South Carolina. Uh, sir, I didn't need glasses to lock into Ascent, uh, but uh, I guess reading hundreds of emails uh, on a, a weekly basis uh, does that to you, so I'll try not to use that. Uh, and then just to one up, uh, Colonel Adams, one more. Uh, he's got the significant emotional event from uh, the Alabama loss, but uh, you'll have to bear with me. As an immigrant, I'm a, uh, English as a second language, so you'll have to kind of work through that. And if I uh, throw any Hungarian, uh, words in there, I'll make sure I back to my <laughs> Sir, uh, on behalf of Lieutenant General Costella and uh, the men and women of the uh, U.S. Air Force Central Command, uh, it's great to be here with you. Uh, General Costella definitely wanted to uh, have me share some of his thoughts with you and the team here today. Uh, we are, make no mistake about it, we are a war fighting headquarters at Accent Shaw. We run a split staff uh, in that uh, about two thirds of our staff is at uh, Accent Shaw and about a third are forward deployed into uh, Qatar. But uh, that is the command control element that is uh, U.S. Air Force uh, Central Command. Uh, we deploy every, every six months about 14,000 airmen into harm's way. Many of them, as Chairman McCarty uh, mentioned, are South Carolina natives. Uh, they deploy into uh, Afghanistan, they deploy into Iraq, Syria. And uh, make no mistake about it, the men and women that uh, you have uh, provided to the, uh, the Combined Forces Air, Air Component Commander are doing a phenomenal job. They get uh, bombs on time, on target, into uh, where the warfighter needs uh, to be. Uh, a very significant milestone recently announced 
uh, the defeat of the physical caliphate that was ISIS. And that is a phenomenal uh, joint team effort and made it possible also by the command control that uh, resides at Shah, resides forward, and the men and women, women that deploy into that. ISIS, as everybody knows, is just a very, very horrific organization that gained traction, an ideology that gained traction and then gained ground and brought a level of violence uh, to the battlefield that was not uh, expected. And it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears uh, to be able to push that tie back and create a, a, the conditions, again, through that joint team by which we were able to, I say we, the Syrian Democratic Forces were able to announce last week that the physical caliphate is defeated. The work is still needs to be done. While the physical caliphate is defeated, they are going back into a counterinsurgency mindset. They are rats, you know, swimming away from a sinking ship, and we need to continue to hunt them, and we need to continue to track them down, either bring them to justice, or uh, have them come meet their maker as they so choose. Uh, General Vestella has two jobs. He calls it a day job and a night job. His day job is to, as the Combined Forces Air Component Commander, serve two very major uh, fights, one in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, Syria, and those are di different types of fights, as the gentleman around the table can attest to. It's just different working with different partner forces, whether you're talking in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And as the air component, we bring that air power to be able to enable our partner forces to get after it and get the job done. But that's done through the air power that is command controlled by, uh, by absent, and, uh, and a good element of that is that uh, Shah Air Force. Joe Vestel's night job is to ensure stability and uh, stability in the region, and to ensure that other regional ac actors, we'll name names, Iran, need to continue to act in a very responsible manner as set forth by the international community. And that's no big, uh, you know, no big feat that, uh, that we're undertaking as well. So that's his night job where he is putting more and more weight of em emphasis on it. And we recognize that General McKenzie, as alluded to earlier, the new CENTCOM commander, is shifting his uh, focus uh, to that centerpiece as well and making sure that Iran continues to be a responsible member of the international community. To do that, to do, to do his day job, night job, and provide command control of 14,000 uh, deployed air and active reserve guard components all, all alike. He's got a staff. I mentioned about two thirds of those airmen are at uh, Afsan Shah. And uh, that provides the bulk of our active duty permanent party civilians and contractor workforce. We have around 1,060 airmen to include the, that construct that I just outlined uh, that live, work at Shaw. And uh, as General uh, Beagle mentioned earlier and as stated previously, these airmen are not just isolated to the base. We live, we work in the community, we have families that attend schools. I have four children that are in the public school system. Uh, my daughter does competition dance there. I've got Cub Scouts. I'm very good leader. I got roped in that one pretty, pretty uh, same and, um, But I enjoy that. My wife works uh, in uh, at uh, now Prisma uh, Health Unit uh, in the local hospital system. So we are shoulder to shoulder with uh, with our partners and our teammates in the community, and we definitely appreciate that. As General Costella uh, took command uh, back in August of last year, he looked at uh, how he needed to balance his time uh, and and how he needed to kind of uh, ensure that he. Uh, commanded and controlled the forces that are under Today, he has spent pro approximately one third of his time, as he terms it, fighting from Shaw, and he feels very comfortable doing that, and his intent is to continue to do more of that. Within the last year, we moved 107 airmen that were previously deployed uh, forward to different functions within our air operations center, moved those back to Shaw because he recognizes that through the technology and the capability that we have, he can command and control the forces halfway around the world from just about anywhere. His intent is to continue to do more of that because big air force is going through some very significant readiness and retention concerns. Our belief is that airmen, if they have to deploy to certain functions, it's probably more appealing to be able to deploy to Shaw than uh, have to go forward. And if they are closer time zones to their families, they can call and stay in touch with their loved ones. And if family emergency arises, they are very easily picked up, bought an airplane ticket, we send them home, they resolve the emergency, and come back and continue on with the rest of their deployment. We intend to do more of that. General Costello has asked the staff to do a one-to-end review of all of our deployed airmen and the, the roles that they play and to determine which of those functions can continue to migrate back to Afghanistan. 
Uh, Dr. Carl Malley, I know that's going to be uh, an impact to the base. It's going to be an impact to, to the community. But we believe one is a responsible uh, decision and an attempt to look at. But we also believe it's the right thing to do because, again, from absent shell, we're able to fight and project power and command and control as needed. So I mentioned that uh, we have about 1,060 airmen, civilians, and uh, contractors that work and live in the, the community. community. And we have about 135 of those uh, airmen that are doing six-month rotations uh, to Shaw, and then they rotate back out. That is going to be a constant uh, uh, model that uh, ASCENT uh, continues to follow. Up. So let me step back a little bit from the operational side of the house. And let me tell you, uh, when you make 06 or colonel in the Air Force, uh, it's a little bit of a humbling experience. There's not a lot of fanfare. As a matter of fact, you get a, an email that's very anonymous. It might as well be addressed to, to whom it may concern. Uh, it says, Basically, none of you are special. All of you have children uh, that are that are in high school and middle school, and all of you have aging parents. So, uh, you know, the needs of the Air Force come first. So, sir, the reason I share that with you is because uh, one of the challenges that uh, Absent uh, does experience are uh, well, twofold: um, medical and the educational opportunities that uh, that we have access to. On the medical side of the house, uh, Absent uh, Airmen and families definitely take full advantage of the, of the local community. Uh, and partnerships within the, the health infrastructure have to offer with the specialties uh, that, that reside here in Columbia and elsewhere. The challenge, though, that, uh, that we experience is that Absent does have a difficult time attracting high-end, high-talent, senior officers, senior enlisted members uh, that have families that require exceptional family care in terms of behavioral or uh, mental health capabilities. Those are areas that uh, we continue to work with our local community, work with Colonel uh, O'Malley and the team at Shaw to identify those requirements so that you and the, uh, the task force can uh, look to address those as we continue to move forward. But that is a significant impact when uh, a member, a senior member, whether it's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Carl, uh, Senior Master Sergeant, Chief Master Sergeant, are identified to come to Shaw Air Force Base. Sometimes their ability to come, that high-end talent, their ability to come to Shaw is limited because of exceptional family medical concerns or capabilities uh, that the medical community uh, feels may not be well serviced within the local area. And then by a tremendous margin, very similar concerns, access to high quality uh, public school education opportunities uh, is one of the sig significant most concerns that our airmen uh, share with us when they, uh, when they when we induct them and brief them into the command as to what, what, what are their concerns. Again, I mentioned I've got uh, four children in the public school system. They are thriving. They are doing phenomenally. Uh, part of that is because I can snoop electronically and make sure that I keep track of their assignments and what, what they have come to do, but also because of the, the tremendous work that their teachers put into, into their education. What I will share with you is that uh, we, we collectively, and I'm not just pointing fingers, but we collectively need to do more of that because our children uh, are, again, not just uh, transients, but they do come in, they stay for three to four years, they, they leave. But more often than not, we have family members that elect to retire and stay in South Carolina. Maybe stealing a little bit of chrome and all these thunder, but uh, one of the things that I found out when I first moved to Shaw, somebody told me that Shaw is actually an acronym. They, I didn't believe it, but it actually is an acronym that says "Stay Here a While," and uh, it is true. My predecessor, uh, previous chief of staff, elected to retire and stay in the local area because his children were thriving and enjoying that uh, opportunities that were provided in the summer uh, community. I definitely see the benefit of that. My children have loved uh, the opportunity that they've had here. I share these concerns with you as a part of uh, how do we continue to draw high-end talent uh, to South Carolina and ensure that uh, as these uh, folks reach the uh, point in their uh, careers where they need to make a decision about where they retire, where they stay, I think these are going to be continue to be, uh, be attractive opportunities. And, sir, we appreciate your leadership on the educational front. I know you've been actively engaged in that. And as previously mentioned, the, uh, the legislation that you have moving forward on the veterans' health and Veterans Affairs uh, is definitely going to continue to be those uh, opportunities that, that make Sumter and Shaw and South Carolina very appealing and attractive for those that uh, would like to take off the uniform today. So if any of your questions, that's all I've got. Thank you. I would, would like to uh, respond, and you, you're right. Uh, we, as far as medical health, telehealth, Telemedicine is a far as an answer to that. And with the medical university, especially the medical university of South Carolina, they are leading 
leading the nation in, in some areas in providing specialized care through uh, 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 telehealth. And we are moving forward with that. We are aware of the need to, for hospitals and medical care in a lot of the rural areas. And, and those are, uh, we're working on that with the, the people in this room are quite aware. On education, we understand as well, you may have noticed this year, we were making some bold reforms attempting and moving through the legislature. We understand that to, to, to put it in uh, perspective, in the context, to have a great reputation for economic growth and prosperity is excellent, and we have that. But a part of that is uh, our reputation in education. And to have a reputation for being weak in some places in our state in education is not good. But to have a reputation for being weak in some places and not recognizing and doing something about it is a disaster. So that is in that spirit of the, the uh, leaders in the legislature are attempting uh, right now to make some concrete steps to address those things that you have mentioned. Any other comments, questions, suggestions? Here we go. Thank you. It's amazing. Thanks, sir. Our next speaker is, is Colonel Derek O'Malley uh, with Shaw Air Force Base. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Derek O'Malley representing Shaw Air Force Base and the commander of the 20th Fighter Wing and installation commander of Shaw Air Force Base, so taking care of all our mission partners, that's in our and Ninth Air Force as well. We are the largest F-16 combat wing in the Air Force and actually also in the world. So I could go on and on about how awesome we are, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to focus on a few areas where we actually need your help, Governor. I specifically like to highlight five areas where South Carolina can help the leaders of Shire Air Force Base take better care of our airmen, soldiers, and their families. Starting with traffic. Recently, my concerns with traffic safety outside of Shire Air Force Base on Highway 378 have grown significantly. This section of Highway 378 that passes in front of Shire Air Force Base in our Veterans Park has a posted speed limit of 55 miles per hour. I asked that the South Carolina Department of Transportation lower that speed to 45 miles per hour. And we also seek DOT approval of the establishment of a traffic light at the Oleander Drive intersection as an additional means of slowing traffic in this area. Right now the traffic is just moving too, too rapidly and has proven sadly to be fatal twice over the last few years. DOT's approval to lower the speed limit and add a traffic light will help ensure the safety of not only our airmen, but also the members of the community who frequently travel to the stretch of highways. We appreciate your support on that one. Uh, shifting topics. Governor, I know you're aware of the challenges the Sumter School District is facing at this time. We've talked a little bit about this already. I'd like to reiterate that leaders at Shire Air Force Base and military parents whose children attend school in the Sumter School District are concerned by the current financial state within the district. We receive continual feedback from those assigned to Shaw that the school district is one of their greatest concerns when they receive an assignment here. The average military child transitions six to 10 times during the course of their parent's <laughs> career. My son, who's a senior at Sumter High School, has moved 12 times. And with every move, parents seek the best educational opportunities for their children and put significant effort into choosing the right fit for their child and personal situation. It has become increasingly difficult to reassure military members arriving at Shaw that the Sumter School District can provide a sound education for their children. And for that reason, there are some airmen who avoid coming to Shaw Air Force Base at all costs. And often, those who are assigned to Shaw make the decision to live outside of Sumter County and commute up to an hour one way to get the benefit of good education for their children. Along these same lines, we also ask South Carolina to begin preferential treatment in their controlled open enrollment process to dependent children of active duty military personnel. At this time, the Sumter School District's open enrollment window just lasts a month, and the process is not only cumbersome, but it's not well publicized, and this may be indicative of other schools across the state. This limits the opportunity for those military parents who have chosen to send their children to schools within the Sumter School District to make the best educational choice for their family. This change to open enrollment programs across South Carolina will alleviate much stress and hardship for military members throughout the entire state. As General Beagle mentioned, we are greatly appreciative of the efforts thus far in raising awareness on the issue of military spouse licensing and certification and the proposal of the Armed Service Members Spouses and Professional Occupational Licensing Act. The employment of military spouses is not simply a concern for military spouses themselves or the family for that matter. 
It is also a concern that plays a role in our readiness on the national scale. When military spouses are unemployed, that can often cause stress and strain on the family unit, which at its worst can lead the military member to step away from their service. During a time when retention of personnel is critical, this is very concerning. So we ask for the state's approval of the Armed Service Members, Spouses, and Professional Occupational Licensing Act as swiftly as possible. We are also grateful to both the House and the Senate for the efforts that have been made on the Workforce Enhancement and Military Recognition Act. It's already been spoken of. I know you're well aware of that, Governor, so I'll skip my comments on that. But the passing of that act is not only a benefit for our military members in South Carolina who have sacrificed greatly in the service to this nation, but it is also in the best interest of the businesses and companies here in South Carolina who will inherit an outstanding group of veterans uh, in the workforce. Finally, I'd like to make you aware of the changes uh, that are happening in our medical community as the <coughs> medical services transition to the Department of Defense, excuse me, to the Department of Health Administration in the Defense Health Agency. <coughs> With this transition, there will be significant changes to how medical services are provided to our military members. Most shockingly, the medical corps will lose nearly 5,000 providers over the next three years, and that's just in the Air Force alone. This is impacting all of the services, um, so it would be a significant reduction in providers. If medical providers in the surrounding areas haven't already seen this, they will soon see an influx in medical referrals, specifically for dental, mental health, and pediatric care. We would ask that healthcare providers in the surrounding area remain open to partnering with TRICARE and our military medical professionals in order to provide the best care for our airmen, soldiers, and their families. I'll just go off script here to wrap this up, Governor. Uh, General Dunford, the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, a great Marine leader, on his desk in the Pentagon, he has a, a box, and in that box, the name of every Marine that died under his command uh, through the years. And on that box is inscribed three, uh, a few simple words, make it matter. So as I think about the sacrifices of everybody that here in uniform makes, and really more importantly, the sacrifices that our families make, uh, we need to make it matter. I have my wife here with us here today. Um, and so often when I came home from combat tours, and I know my friends at the table will feel the same way, they'll pin medals on your chest for what you've done, and so often I wish they'd pin those medals on my wife and on our families, because truly they're the ones that are making the sacrifices that are the hardest. So Governor, anything you can do to support us in these initiatives, we'll truly do just that and make it matter. So we greatly appreciate your support and the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Concerning, concerning the, the school district there, um, you may be aware that um, Representative Merle Smith and Superintendent Molly Spearman and I and others have had numerous uh, conversations and uh, uh, trying to improve that situation immediately. <coughs> We're well aware of that. And of course, what you said is part of what we talked about just a few minutes ago was necessary for strong education everywhere. Any suggestions, comments? Hearing none, Colonel, thank you. Our next speaker is, is Colonel Tim Miller with the Marine Corps Station in Buford. Home right now, which is very unique. 
Uh, that hasn't happened in over a decade. Uh, so we have a lot of flying going on, a lot of people preparing, getting ready for exercises as well as getting ready for deployments. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, uh, we have some challenges associated with the airfield. Uh, our runway, 523, which is our primary runway, uh, 12,000 foot, is going to be shut down soon in the spring, early summer. We shut that down for almost a year, uh, probably a year plus. And uh, that's going to cause some challenges and congestion. It's also going to uh, cause challenges as far as the uh, pattern. But uh, we're going to continue to stay busy. The, the, the squadron will continue to fly. In addition to that, we have our F-35 training squadron. And uh, their pilot training requirement for this past year was 34 pilots, which is quite a bit. And they've increased it to 50 uh, for this coming year, which is quite a bit more. So it's going to be a lot of flying. And, uh, in addition to that, we'll be having, uh, we're doing construction right now for another hangar for our next F-35 training squadron. So uh, it's gonna get very busy at, in the airspace of uh, Beaufort before we start trimming back and sending squadrons out to other areas. In addition, uh, because of that, uh, it's very critical that we have the, the training pieces in place to allow those squadrons to operate uh, to the max capacity. And that's where Townsend Bombing Range comes in. This is the range that we've established in Georgia, and it's a great news story for us. Uh, over 30,000 acres of range targets that will be complete uh, by December of 19, and we expect to be done early, and that's increased the capacity and the ability of uh, all the squadrons to train, uh, but specifically the F-35 to get all the training they need for their, uh, for their curriculum, which is awesome. Uh, I will reiterate what uh, General Glenn said regarding the economic impact of the air station to the local community. We, uh, we enjoy a very strong relationship with uh, Beaufort County, and we appreciate uh, what they have contributed to us and what they've been able to do for us. At the same time, we are uh, a part of that community and we contribute back. Uh, we are very active, and of course, uh, financially, we, uh, we infuse quite a bit uh, into their community. It's been uh, very beneficial for us to work alongside with the South Carolina Military Base Task Force. Uh, they have helped us immensely in uh, tackling challenges and then pursuing new initiatives uh, so that we can remain uh, operationally uh, impacted uh, by the, uh, the uh, renewable energy that's going on. Uh, many opportunities for renewable energy have been pursued in the local area, and we appreciate the fact that the Military Base Task Force has worked with us so that uh, it has not impeded our operations. It's been very beneficial to us. Both wind and solar uh, can be problematic for the jets, and it's good that uh, for now we've been able to uh, defend that off and continue to operate with, uh, without being impeded. I will say that uh, we also have an air show coming up. Uh, we have an air show coming up this month, at the end of the month, uh, 27th and 28th. We look forward to uh, a great air show. Of course, the Blue Angels will be there, the F-22 uh, Raptor demo. And uh, something unique for the first time will be the F-35 uh, demonstration. And this is unique in the sense that it's uh, going to expand the envelope from anything that we've seen before. Uh, the pilot who's going to be flying has actually been training for it for quite a while, and uh, we expect it to be a great demonstration. Uh, other firsts that we're going to have there, we're going to have a STEM event for local fifth graders uh, in the community in Beaufort County. Uh, that's something significant. We're inviting all the, all the local schools to come out on the 26th, uh, Friday, for a half a day of uh, interaction and opportunity to get hands on as well as meet some of the performers uh, that are going to be participating in the air show. And the final thing that's uh, unique about this particular show is the opportunity to give back again to the community and reach out to the community. We have something called the Air Show After Dark. This is something we're doing for the first time. Uh, Port Royal, the town of Port Royal is actually hosting it. We're working alongside of Beaver County as well as the Chamber of Commerce to host this event. Uh, it should be a great opportunity. The Blue Angels will be there as well as other performers going out to the town. A free event and an opportunity for us to publicize the Air Show as well as uh, get out and meet the community. So uh, something new and hopefully something we can continue to do with uh, future air shows. Governor, of course, you're always welcome. We look forward to seeing you there in the uh, Finally, I'll just say that uh, it's been, uh, been great working alongside of, uh, of the state. The collaboration that uh, we've had has been uh, 
very important to ensure that we as their station can function, whether it be during uh, crisis management mode or just during daily operations. We, we see the, the benefits and uh, we appreciate the way that the military is very much uh, taken care of while we're here in South Carolina. So from Low Country, sir, that is all I have to present. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions, suggestions, ideas? Hearing none, Colonel, thank you. Our, our next speaker we're privileged to have from across the river, uh, Colonel Rudder, with the, uh, uh, he's Chief of Staff of the Cyber Center of Excellence uh, in, in uh, Fort Garden, Fort. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, Governor, Governor McMaster, Congressman, Congressman Wilson, came on this way. Uh, it is an honor just to say a few words this morning about the growth at Fort Gordon uh, that we see occurring there, uh, what it means for the expanding our partnership with South Carolina, uh, and Major General John Morrison is the Commanding General of Cyber Center of Excellence at Fort Gordon. He couldn't be here today. Uh, members of Congress called him, and he's up in D.C. today. Before I begin, I would like to mention that my lovely wife is with me this morning to make sure I stay in line and watch the words. Um, as you know, Fort Gordon is located in Augusta, Georgia. However, uh, our geographic area of influence is much larger than the city itself. Uh, it is the entirety of the central Savannah River area, which, as you know, uh, is a region spanning 13 counties in the Georgia side in eight counties on the South Carolina side. So if you put a star burst on top of Augusta, Georgia, where Fort Gordon is, the flare of that circle would span both states over the border in those, those uh, different counties. We are a major employer in the Central Savannah River area with the daily presence on the base of more than 34,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, uh, DA civilians, DOD civilians, and their family members. More than 80,000 military retirees, uh, the civilian family members, uh, are supported off base by the communities in both states. Throughout the CSRA, uh, many of our workforce live in South Carolina. Fort Gordon has an annual economic impact of nearly $2.3 billion which goes directly into shops, real estate, banks, and other businesses throughout the CSRA. Fort Gordon itself is a large, globally engaged, multi-mission and multi-service installation. This stands in stark contrast to even the previous decade where Fort Gordon was known as the Sleepy Hollow Trade-Out Training Base, uh, small in its nature, that mission has, has changed. We are still a trade-out base, but trade-out training mission comprises only one-third of what happens on Fort Gordon. Uh, there are a large number of military intelligence brigades on Fort Gordon. The cyberspace training mission itself uh, to support the operational workforce and, and through our cyberspace operations. Our intelligence security command organizations as well as NSA is a large presence on Fort Gordon. I mentioned NSA, and while the NSA's main headquarters element is at Fort Meade, we see the growing NSA team there at Fort Gordon. The Cyber Center of Excellence under Lieutenant Morrison's head is the element that does all the training on Fort Gordon for communications, cyberspace operations, and electronic warfare operations. That training mission uh, is growing, as well as the Army end strength for those Forces is growing, so our training mission increases. Then the operational forces that are on Fort Gordon is also increasing. Uh, and we are simply trying to keep up with the demand signal for the capability in cyberspace. The United States Army Cyber Command will completely move from the National Capital Region to Fort Gordon in June of 2020. This will co-locate the, co the Army's institutional training base at Fort Gordon with the Army's operational cyberspace workforces. Very unique that the workforces of the institutional training side of the Army and the operational side 
would be co-located. The synergy is unmatched of what can be achieved. This also establishes the Army's commitment to make Fort Gordon a major hub for cybersecurity in the Department of Defense and the United States. To support this growth, the Army has programmed about $1.6 billion in military construction to, to Fort Gordon, for construction on Fort Gordon. This will, this will provide a world-class cyber education campus, and the construction begins this year. The other part of that funding will support the facilities to house our Army, Army Cyber Command Forces, and that project is already very near to uh, completion. One of our biggest challenges, and part of the reason why I'm here, uh, not just from a, uh, the commercial impact of the region of Shrine Fort Gordon, it is one about the academic partnerships, and we've heard throughout this morning the necessity of cyber, cyberspace, STEM, uh, and I heard a demand signal for a lot more of that throughout uh, the state of South Carolina. And what I'm offering is that Fort Gordon is that partner that is needed to help make that happen at a degree greater than what we have today. To get after that point, let me describe a little bit about what we're doing. Our aim is attracting and retaining a world-class cyber workforce, but we have to grow it here also. As Fort Gordon is becoming the cyber hub in the southeast, attracting and retaining is only part of the mission. We have to grow it for the years to come if we are to remain successful. So we are pursuing long-term strategic partnerships with academic institutions across the southeast. We are fostering relationships with these institutions to support the growth of a cyber-capable workforce that meets not only military needs, but the local, regional, national, and society cyber needs. The Cyber Center of Excellence currently has 24 <coughs> memorandums of understanding with 31 schools of higher education, and that includes the University System of Georgia. <coughs> we also have a memorandum of understanding with Aiken Technical College, and we would like to expand on mutually beneficial strategic partnerships with colleges and universities across South Carolina. From a personal perspective, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Our state mascot is a gopher. I would love to be partnered up with universities, the uh, many universities and colleges in South Carolina from a personal perspective. It's exciting to be able to, to, to be part of this discussion and expand these partnerships. We have, a, we have uniquely qualified and geographically positioned organizations collectively, and it makes sense to explore opportunities to establish long-term strategic relationships with, excuse me, with organizations across your state. There are a number of potential opportunities to explore. I'll just name a couple. Mutual access to educational training and technical support. Creating new majors and programs of study in technical fields. <coughs> Exchange of expert guest speaker, speakers and lecturers who have operational expertise. That operational expertise is growing every day on Fort Gordon. They're fighting in that domain, and we're instructing and teaching in that domain. As well as increasing military student enrollment in any of your universities. Of course, <coughs> with tuition and paid for by the United States Army. But our cyber for workforce is much greater than, than just Fort Gordon. Uh, the demand signal for higher education is for these soldiers spread out throughout, uh, across the Army. Uh, uh, it's <coughs> enough that we were, if we were to partner in certain ways with Fort Gordon and the university system in South Carolina, that uh, would be enticing and appealing to our cyber workforce to continue their advanced education, whether it's masters, bachelor's, masters, or PhDs through your universities and colleges in South Carolina. Sir, a strategic partnership between Fort Gordon and South Carolina would be significant in advancing a cyber workforce for years to come, permeated with ethics and leadership. This would advance the interests of South Carolina as well as our national security interests. Across the CSRA, Fort Gordon is recognized as a, a proactive driver uh, that welcomes partnerships. 
So we hope that you keep Fort Gordon on your radar, and we look forward to showcasing Fort Gordon to you or members of uh, your team. We look for an opportunity to expand on these partnerships uh, between Fort Gordon and then South Carolina. Uh, I'll just, uh, stand by for any questions that you have, sir, that concludes my Thank you. I appreciate you bringing up uh, all, all of those points, and I assure you that this expansion in Fort Gordon has been on our radar for some time, and we're looking forward to a lot of collaborations in our research universities particularly, but also uh, in, in Aiken. I know the leadership there is, is very familiar with what's going on. There's been a lot of conversations, and, but it's a, it's a big deal, and we, we're looking forward to participating. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, Colonel, thank you. And last but absolutely not least is, uh, is Captain John Reed with the Coast Guard. Thank you, Governor McMaster, Congressman Wilson, Chairman Buffet, members of the Military Base Task Force. I'm grateful for the continued support of our military members and families. In the, South, in the state of South Carolina. I also appreciate the transparency and advocacy for initiatives of military concern in the state. State agencies have been critical to your Coast Guard's work in and beyond the Palmetto State. The State Law Enforcement Division has been and remains the nucleus of coordination and collaboration at the Seahawk Interagency Operations Center. Chief Keel's investment of personnel resources sets the standard, and I leverage this relationship to achieve our common objectives. It's a standard other sector commanders around the country seek to achieve. We are currently cooperating with SLED to address active shooter, active threat scenarios, and response to those in the maritime environment. From the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, search and rescue to fisheries and boating safety enforcement, our relationship with DNR remains strong, and the collaboration has contributed to closing gaps in our operational coverage. Additionally, the cooperation in identifying and addressing illegal charters has been particularly beneficial as those types of operations represent an area of particular concern to our marine safety mission. DNR remains a consistent and contributing partner at Seahawk. The South Carolina National Guard and Emergency Management Division. The cooperation between South Carolina EMD and Coast Guard forces in response to Hurricane Florence provided options for General Livingston and his team last September. I am planning to further improve our integration and connectivity in support of the state's emergency management regime with General McCarty and Director Stinson. Furthermore, the South Carolina National Guard's participation in our cyber subcommittee of the Maritime Security Committee has provided subject matter expertise to, to address this growing cyber threats to our maritime transportation system. The South Carolina National Guard remains a full-time Seahawk participant and contributor to operations. The State Ports Authority has been highly collaborative as we dealt with Hurricanes Florence and Michael, managing risks and minimizing impact to the state's economic engine that is the port. There are also key participants in the Port Readiness Committee and Maritime Security Committee. I'm confident the State Port Authority's safety and security concerns are not disconnected from those of the Coast Guard, and I appreciate and consider their financial and business objectives. Finally, I greatly appreciate the continued support of the state's Department of Health and Environmental Control, from environmental response during the floods to planning for oil spill contingencies. DHEC remains fully engaged in our environmental response work. I just provided a quick sampling of how South Carolina state agencies help the Coast Guard accomplish our safety, security, and stewardship missions. And I trust these agencies would view the Coast Guard's work as complementary and at least equally beneficial to their objectives. One quick and heartfelt shout out to the people of South Carolina who graciously supported our service members through the partial government shutdown earlier this year. While the lack of paychecks had direct and immediate impacts of varying degrees on our families, the outpouring of support exceeded what I could have expected and provided assurance that our families would not go without basic human needs. Further, our members would be able to continue their work through resolution of the budget issue. Thank you. On to plan and potential growth. Today, 900 Coast Guard members call South Carolina home. Assigned to cutters, stations, aids to navigation teams, the Maritime Law Enforcement Academy, 
the Coast Guard base and Coast Guard sector. They conduct and support a range of Coast Guard missions, not only along South Carolina's coast, but around the world. By 2022, the Coast Guard has firm plans in place to add 300 more service members and their families to the greater Charleston area as we grow by two national security cutters and associated support personnel. Coast Guard Cutter Stone, the ninth hall of the legend class, will arrive in Charleston in January 2021. Her crew will begin arriving in Charleston this summer. Hall number 10, not yet named, will arrive just over a year later. On the potential growth side, Charleston is being considered for the home porting of at least one more national security cutter, that would be hall number 11, and likely the final ship of a legend class. An unde undetermined number, likely four, offshore patrol cutters, which are the replacements for our overworked medium endurance cutter fleet. A buoy tender, rehome ported, and a patrol boat also rehome ported. The current plans and future plans will require infrastructure investment beyond what our services budget has ever seen. The waterfront infrastructure and mission support requirements for these new cutters remain a budget priority for our service and will be necessary to realize and sustain the operational advantage of these new assets into the coming decades. This growth has been the catalyst for our services area development or master plan for Charleston. It involves Coast Guard infrastructure and our needs. Commencing last summer, the area development plan is undergoing final internal stakeholder review at this time before Coast Guard senior leader approval. This document will establish the Coast Guard's intent for the future of Charleston and guide our budget requests going forward. Additionally, the Department of Homeland Security has commenced a review of its footprint and role at the federal complex in North Charleston. That, as part of the DHS efficiency review, we anticipate there may be changes to the roles and responsibilities of the Coast Guard as a result of that review. On the personnel side, building on the many South Carolina men and women currently serving as civilians, auxiliaries, reservists, and active duty members, we are bolstering our relationship with the Citadel's Auxiliary University program and South Carolina State University to attract young people of South Carolina towards service in the Coast Guard. Additionally, we understand there is strong interest in starting a Coast Guard Junior ROTC program in the Charleston area. I believe this could be the third program of its type in the nation. From an improvements point of view, I seek to collaborate with state and local partners to deal with derelict vessels. These derelict vessels litter the, uh, the coastal regions of South Carolina and often cause uh, disruptions and uh, uh, search and rescue cases that are unnecessary. Additionally, we're working to identify solutions to the large gap in our northern area responsibility, specifically Myrtle Beach. Operations up there require us to trailer boats from Georgetown and uh, up to the, the Little River area uh, to conduct operations. We're looking at partnering with uh, DNR and others to identify locations to make that, uh, to close that gap. In closing, we are aware the mayors of the Greater Charleston area are collaborating on a submission to become a, Coast Guard, a designated Coast Guard community, officially recognizing what Coast Guard men and women have known for a very long time. That is, specifically, the Low Country heartily supports their United States Coast Guard. Thank you again for your time and the opportunity to address the Military Base Task Force. Thank you, Governor McMaster, for your continued support and advocacy. Subject to your questions, that concludes my brief. Thank you very much. Suggestions, questions, ideas, anyone? Yeah. Hearing none. Thank you, sir. Uh, members of the speakers, uh, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, we've we've got a, uh, have had a lot of coverage, and a lot of good ideas, a lot of good input. I know the governor uh, and and the congressman were taking. Uh, multiple notes over here, and so uh, that's always a good sign. Uh, at this time, I, I'll uh, turn the mic back over to uh, the car. And Chairman Bethay, thank you very much. And uh, it, it's just so reassuring to uh, be here, Governor, with you uh, to see the very capable commanders uh, at the bases across South Carolina and Port Gordon, uh, which we appreciate at Augusta, uh, how meaningful this is. And I'm just uh, honored to be here and look forward to continue uh, for our office to work with the governor to uh, promote uh, the military relationships that we have that are so mutually beneficial to the defense of our country and for the people of South Carolina. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. Does that, that concludes our business to put a call. I want to say thank you to all of you and all of you for coming and those who are involved in what we do and who are not here and couldn't make it. But this is very important and it's, uh, it, it's very helpful to me and I know to others to, to hear the, the statements and to get, get the information that we got today. And on a number of those points, I look forward to following up uh, myself and I know others do as well. So being no further business, we thank you and we are adjourned.